Welcome, everyone, to Washington, D.C. Thanks for joining us for the series Envisioning India. I'm James Foster, the co-director of the Institute for International Economic Policy, or IIEP, as we call it, here in the Elliott School of International Affairs at the George Washington University. I'm also the moderator of today's presentation by Pranam Bardhan of Berkeley, who is speaking on the topic Saving Indian Capitalism from Its Capitalists. Pranab, thank you for joining us today from California. Also with us are Michael Walton of Harvard's Kennedy School, who's here in DC, and Jean Drez from Ranchi University, who is joining us from India. They will be providing comments on today's presentation. Now, in just a moment, distinguished visiting scholar at IIEP, Ajay Chibber will set the stage and formally introduce our distinguished guests. But first, I'd like to offer a few words of thanks to our co-sponsor. Our co-sponsor is the Seeger Center of uh, Asian Studies here in the Elliott School. It has the goals of supporting research in Asia, promoting interaction, and educating the next generation. Director Ben Hopkins is himself a prominent historian of modern South Asia. Now, for those of you who haven't attended a previous IAP event, you can expect a nonpartisan, lively, and informative conversation on such topics as U.S.-China economic relations, urbanization and poverty, global economic governance, climate change, green finance, and digital trade. Our China conference series began earlier this year in October with World Bank Chief Economist Carmen Reinhart and resumes after the winter holidays. Our Rethinking Capitalism and Democracy series began with the IMF's Ralph Shami describing one way to value whales, elephants, and other natural capital in order to mobilize resources. Our Facing Inequality series is a multidisciplinary conversation on what is perhaps the main economic challenge of the age. Our next edition this Friday is a discussion of multidimensional poverty in the U.S with Shitakshi Donzi, and uh, she is of George, Georgia Tech, and Brian Glassman of the Census Bureau, and Sabina Alkire of Oxford. India has adopted multidimensional poverty. Why not the US? And if you can't make an event si uh, synchronously, videos can be found on our YouTube channel at IIEPGW. Now over to my colleague, Ajay Chibber, Professor. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, James. You know, the title for today's talk, Saving Capitalism, uh, Indian Capitalism from its Capitalists, is, of course, uh, borrowed from a famous book uh, by Raghuram Rajan and Luigi Zingales. Raghu, of course, spoke at this series uh, a couple of months ago, not on this topic, uh, but on other subjects. Uh, anyway, what is amazing is that in 1990, India was still in something called the License Raj. You know, it was, everything was controlled and businessmen had to get licenses to produce anything. And within about 25 years, it's gone from License Raj to what is described very aptly by James Crabtree as the Billionaire Raj. So within a 25 year period, we've gone from businessmen buying licensing and managing to pay government officials to get licenses to now controlling uh, the entire regulatory structure in India in very sinister kind of ways. As James Crabtree calls his book, A Journey Through India's Gilded Age. Uh, so we have entered in India the G Gilded Age. We have our great Gatsby's, and the epitome of that is Vijay Malia, uh, who's now featured in Netflix series called Bad Boy Billionaires of India. So within a very short period, India has gone from license Raj to billionaire Raj. And we have now huge um, non-performing assets in the banking sector. And if that were not enough, now the corporates want to have their own banks so that they can uh, basically get deposits and siphon off all that money into their businesses. 
So it's a very appropriate subject today, and I'm very pleased to see such a distinguished panel uh, today. Uh, let me start first with John Drez, who is, um, of course, his book, The Uncertain Glory, uh, with uh, uh, Professor Amartya Sen is probably one of the best books I have read on India's development. Um, and of course, he's bring he's such an act. He's not just an economist. He's such an activist that he brings such practical experience to whatever he writes about. Uh, and so, to, probably today we'll see some glimpse of that as well. We have also Michael Walton who was a colleague of mine at the World Bank, and he and I actually, I first worked with him in Zimbabwe, and then he moved on to bigger and better things. He wrote a lot about Mexico, and he's written a brilliant paper with Pratap Banu Mehta on uh, India's state. So we'd be delighted to hear from him. And of course, the, our main speaker today, Professor Bardhan, Pranab Bardhan, really needs no introduction. I mean, he's like, uh, He's done almost everything in economics. He's written in almost every major journal. He's uh, been the editor of many uh, key important journals, including the Journal of Development Economics. 45 years ago, it's hard to believe, he was my professor of international trade. His, by the way, his thesis is actually on international trade, but he's so prolific that he's written on all, almost every subject. And I still remember his brilliant lectures on the hexher olin model and the Rizbinsky theorem. Um, and he looks just today, he looks just like he did 45 years ago. He was, of course, the toughest grader at D school, but I survived his lectures. So, and, and, but he had the clearest lectures as always. So I'm very delighted to introduce to you Professor Pranab Bardhan. Uh, over to you, Pranabda. Thank you, Ajay. And thank you, James, uh, for inviting me uh, to give this lecture. And thank you, everybody, anybody who's, I don't know, anywhere uh, who's listening at this point. Um, I'm speaking from California, where it's very early in the morning. And um, uh, this is not the time of the day when I'm most coherent. Be that as it may, let me now uh, go to the slide that I have just prepared. Um, so let me uh, start with, from my not being possibly coherent, let me start with two more caveats. My talk today would be mainly in the form of some general reflections on systemic issues. Uh, on, and I don't have a great deal of quantitative stuff, which we usually have in economic seminars, as data. My purpose is partly to provoke you so that some of you uh, uh, more data, maybe to say that I'm wrong, but at least uh, to 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 show how I'm wrong. Uh, but I'd, at least I'd like to have see much more quantitative stuff on this very generally. My talk would be, as I said, more stories. Second caveat is that I know some people, at least left will ask me a prior question. Is capitalism worth it? I have some, uh, but talk is not about that. This talk is about saving capitalism from capitalists in the context of India. Uh, if you want to know my views on the, on the subject, uh, I, I, I have written in various places, but most recently I wrote three pieces on social democracy. One of them is on what I call relation between social democracy and capitalism. Uh, you can, uh, if you want, you can download these from 
uh, from the internet. With, let me say, uh, as Ajay hinted, saving capitalism, capitalism, ca capitalists is an old idea in the literature of political economy and economic history. It has been pointed out there are often conflicts in the interests of capital between the individual capitalist and the capitalist class as a whole, or between the short term and the long term interests of capital. That's really what the saving part is about. So let me tell you about the varying context in which this expression, saving capital, capitalism from capitalists, has been used. The first to use, as far as I can uh, remember, um, is in the context of 19th century Britain. And this is particularly with reference to the Factory Act and other labor laws that were introduced in Britain. Britain after the Industrial Revolution, beginning of the Industrial Revolution at the beginning of the 18th uh, um, at the beginning of the 19th century, uh, conditions of workers in Britain were horrendous. Uh, at that, even at that time, a lot of people expressed their outrage, uh, including, of course, the novelist Charles Dickens. And he described in detail about the working conditions and living conditions of workers. In fact, sometimes those conditions are called Dickensian. I must say that when I visited some factories and semi-formal establishments of workers in India, uh, I sometimes thought situation in India in, in some parts is uh, worse than Dickensian. But I'll come to that. So it comes to those conditions of workers from eight, uh, 19, sorry, from 1830 to around 1880, for these 50 years, Britain passed a lot of labor laws, factory acts and labor laws, trying to protect uh, the conditions of workers. So in that context, of all people, Karl Marx, in, if you read volume capital, talks about Marx, and in that context, he didn't use the expression saving capitalism from, uh, from capitalist, but I'll tell you the expression that he used. I think if I remember right, he said, capital needs to be protected from its unrestrained passion. That's the expression that Marx used in volume one of Capital um, uh, on this issue of the workers. Uh, then again, in the 20th century, Keynesian economics context, a lot of people have used the same expression. Keynes, in some sense, was trying to save capitalism from the individual interests of capital. And he, he was essentially pointing to the fact that uh, people may be, uh, individual capitalists may be rational in pursuing what they're doing, but collectively it could be irrational and there may be a, a need for intervention. Um, so it came, out, came up in that context of uh, depression era when Keynesian economics was used as a form of saving uh, capitalism from some capitalists. And as Ajay has hinted at, uh, the third time that I have myself have seen it used is in the context of the book by uh, Raghu, uh, Raghu Rajan and uh, uh, Luigi uh, Zingales, which came out, the book came out, I think in 2003, uh, they were not talking about India, but they were talking about the United States. And the context was about the financial deregulation and the developing plutocracy 
in the United States a few, just a few years. I think the book came out around 2003 and just a few years before the financial crisis hit. So that was the context of uh, deregulation and inequality in the context in which um, uh, Raghu and, and Luigi uh, essentially talked about uh, how to save capitalism, in that case, American capitalism, from its own uh, capitalists. So those are different contexts, at least I know, when this expression has been used. Examples of the conflicting interests of capital from the Indian debates, four things. Labor reform, policy relating to vocational education, health policy, and adverse effects of the growing concentration of capital and wealth distribution in India. I will primarily concentrate on the first and the fourth, and very briefly touch on the second and the uh, third. So labor reform will start. Recent changes made in both central and some state government labor laws, and I shall concentrate on the central government reform. Labor reform has been widely acclaimed as a landmark in both business circles and financial media. There are, I think, earlier 40 central labor laws, of which 29 central labor laws have been now replaced in four codes. Codes. The new laws were passed in the parliament with no discussion, zero discussion, or zero explanation why some of the recommendations of the parliamentary party were ignored or substantially altered. No explanation offered in the parliament. Several of the new laws involved dilution of labor rights and regulatory oversight. One of the most important issues is that of job security. The main provision now is that retrenchment, layoffs and closures have been made much easier for enterprises employing less than 300 workers. This has already been adopted in three or four states, but now it's nationwide. Say that this is an issue that I have looked at for quite some time. I've written on it before. And I have looked at the disaggregated data, farm level data. I have never been fully sure how much of a binding constraint the previous labor law, previous labor law on this issue was. It is a constraint, but I'm talking about a binding constraint. I mean, that I could give you many others. I've written on this, so I'm not going to go into that. Uh, one is that by now, uh, for quite some time, one third of the labor force in the formal sector, contract labor, even the biggest firms, 30 to 40 percent of workers are contract laborers who do not have web benefits, who do not have security. So in that sense, the flexibility was already there. Uh, so it could need not be binding. Another issue that I wanted to tell you, once uh, some years back, one of my students in Berkeley, an Indian student, she was working on the manufacturing industry. She collected the data from annual survey of industries, farm enterprise-wise data. And also then she stitched the formal sector data with the informal data available periodically from the National Sample Survey, so stitch them together. So I asked her, um, could you give me the scatter? Give me the scatter plots for the, for the most, most labor intensive industries, garment industry. So scatters of farm sizes of the garment industry, thousands of them. Since at that time, the limit 
uh, now it's 300 workers, the limit hundred. So I was expecting really a binding constraint, 100 workers. Uh, um, um, after 100 workers, you, you need government permission to uh, sack laborers. You should expect then just below 100, a lot of bunching of farms because they wanted to avoid uh, hitting the threshold of the earlier labor law. And I should tell you, I did not see any bunching, hardly, hardly any bunching in the, I shouldn't say hardly, no bunching um, uh, around 100. So that all made me a little suspicious. Anyway, in that case, let me, I'm very much in favor of more flexibility in labor employment, but only as a part of a package deal with a reasonable scheme of unemployment benefits for workers. Instead, the new law, the insecure life of workers is insecure. They have, they have provided 15 days wages as the severance pay, and that's it, no other benefits. By the way, uh, in the earlier version of the law, which was, in, um, which was submitted to the parliament in 19, uh, 2019, it was 45 days wages. They decided in the final act, it's only 15 days wages as a severance pay. I think a lot of people agree, and I have written on this too, we need an unemployment benefit fund where there should be contributions, regular contributions by the employer, the employee, and the state. No scope for that in the new labor codes. Feature in the inter is the introduction of fixed term labor contracts without any specification of the duration of the term. Is it two weeks, two years, or what? No specification in the la new labor law, or no specification about the duration of the how many times the term can be renewed. In China, Vietnam. Countries not very friendly to organized labor, fixed term contracts are there, but they can only be renewed at most twice, after which the worker is to be made permanent, but not in the Indian labor law. Danger in India of massive casualization of the labor force, even in the formal sector. Hurts not just ultimately their employers as well. The scope given to workers for learning, taking responsibility, or showing creativity. Capitalizing a longer horizon should be aware that an insecure, disgruntled, and unstable labor force is a sure bet for low productivity. In this context, let me tell you about some references uh, in the general context of labor markets. Robert Solo has an old book, short book called Labor Market as a Social Institution. Um, there, he said the labor market is not like other markets. Labor market is not. Labor market is some special social feature. And Labor market is somewhere issues like dignity, uh, issues like fairness, issues like uh, uh, responsibility, uh, reciprocity. Those become very important, which we don't usually uh, discuss in the con in consideration of other markets. That's what Robert Solo's book is about. Labor market is different from other markets, and more recently, from again from MIT. Sloan School of Management is a new book, 2014 book by Zeynep Ton, The Good Job Strategy, gives examples of successful companies around the world to show how higher investment in workers results in higher profits and greater consumer satisfaction. What about innovation? If you look up the Bloomberg ranking of countries in the Global Innovation Index, United States is in the ninth position 
in the world. And the top eight countries include some of the more labor friendly social democratic countries like Germany, Sweden, Denmark, and Finland. I, of course, welcome the attempt to bring some order to the tangled mess that the old Indian labor laws were in. But in some ways, the new victory, full of gaping loopholes, and much is left to government discretion. For example, there is a promise, welcome promise, of extending social security benefits to even to informal. But in the labor, if you read the labor code, codes, no clear details of how that should be funded, who will fund it, uh, is it the employer, is it the state, is it the workers, no, not much detail, and no detail about implementation. Instead, you will see bland statement like, that the government, and this is I'm quoting from the Labour Court, the government shall frame and notify suitable welfare schemes from time to time. Occupational and safety codes applicability is subject to size thresholds. So for certain sizes, you don't have to satisfy national and safety codes. There is no minimum mandatory entitlements across states, particularly for construction workers, unorganized and migrant workers. In addition, earlier restrictions on employment of women in hazardous occupations have been removed. But after the codes passed to uh, the president's, uh, got the president assent, more recently, about two weeks back, I think, I saw in the newspaper that the the government has recently proposed a lengthening the limit of the work, work day to 12 hours. I was reminded again in this context, I told you about, already about Karl Marx in volume one of Capital, uh, seeing the factory acts in Britain in the 19th century, and he had a lot of comments on the length of the day. Workers are being overworked. And the factory acts were trying to reduce the limit of the workday. And in that context, Marx said, ask a farmer, should he go on cultivating the land day in and day out? Or should he keep some land fallow for some time? And he says, for the long-term productivity of land, any farmer knows that you cannot overwork the land you need to keep it fallow for some time. And he used that in the context of overworking the workers and lived so uh, arguing for why the, the, the limit of the day, uh, the work day should be limited. And in that, I was reminded of it because the central government is now proposing lengthening the limit of the work day to 12 hours. Apart from what the disadvantage this will put to women workers, uh, their general issue there's a general issue of uh, uh, productivity. Almost all the new courts, it is explicitly stated that the government will have the power to exempt any industrial establishment from the provisions of the code. In other words, here is the law, but uh, we can give you exemption, any, any establishment. So there's a lot of arbitrariness. Also in the Industrial Relations Code, it is stated that the government will have the power to modify or reject any verdict of the arbitration type tribunals in industrial disputes. The government can reject any so uh, the verdict of the tribunal. Among other things, this overlooks the conflict of interest when the government itself or the public enterprise is one of the parties. In the occupation health court, civil courts have been barred hearing any disputes arising on the court. Where workers go if employers renege on their obligations. I conclude this part and say for far too long 
Businesses in India, with some notable exceptions, have considered labor as a necessary but troublesome cog in the production machine. And the focus is to squeeze the maximum out of it with minimum pay and benefits while brandishing the threat of job insecurity. On the other hand, trade unions, often under politicized partisan leadership from outside, have played the same adversarial game. Interests of both sides to see at the ground level that labor-friendly practices can actually enhance long-term productivity and profitability. If cooperation can replace mutual suspicion and labor representatives can be trusted to participate in corporate governance, as is the practice, say, in Germany and few other European countries, labor organization can actually play a responsible role in achieving mutually beneficial goals. And by myopic businessmen and their media supporters, the government is taking our labor protections the opposite way. More distrust, labor unrest, and stagnation in worker productivity. Move on to the second, very quickly, vocational education and capitalist prudence. One of the big problems Indian employers will tell you that quite often the labor, the worker, even if uh, he or she is unemployed, available, uh, the worker is not employable because of the poor skills, poor um, uh, training. But, and, and in fact, the government of in, uh, the, the, the current regime, with a lot of fan, fanfare, uh, started this program called Skill India, for exactly for that part. As far as I know, this hasn't worked very well. And, and therefore, you don't hear about it too much these days. Um, I think here, the capitalists themselves can get involved in the training programs and the journey. Teacher example, where when you are finishing high school, there's a whole, most of these uh, students essentially are taken into, uh, are, trans, are channeled into a vocational education program in Germany. And much of it is funded by the businessmen, not by the state. Much of it is funded by the businessmen. Why? Because they, in this process, they reduce their own search costs in the labor market because they know who's good at what, which worker is likely to be good at what. So a detailed skill, um, uh, skill basis of this uh, uh, search for workers uh, is also part of this. And that's one of the reasons why German business uh, um, pays a very uh, large part of the vocational education program. Health policy. It is in the obvious interest of the employer to have good health care for the workers. Tribute to provision for better public health and sanitation in the local community where the workers may live, because public health and sanitation in the local community affects the health of the worker that the employer is employing. In that context, uh, one can make many suggestions. Let me make just two quickly. Local municipalities may float public health bonds, inviting corporates to hold them as part of corporate social responsibility programs. Another suggestion could be factories with health clinics for workers may make them accessible even to non-workers in the local neighborhoods. And there are many other suggestions one can make. In general, most measures, India carries one of the severest disease burdens in the world. That's WHO data. I'm not talking about the pandemic now, but in general, for a long time, India carries one of the severest disease burdens in the world. Yet India's health budget as percentage of GDP has been chronically one of the lowest, even among developing countries. Vietnam, for example, the percentage is three times as much as India's. 
a more prudent capitalist class would have contributed to and lobbied for a much larger health budget and worker entitlements to public health benefits could have been made portable and the capitalist class could have lobbied for it. But you don't hear about in, that in India, either from the capitalist class, uh, business class, uh, or in the, even the health is not an election issue most of the time. And that's really one of the scandals of, of Indian politics. Last uh, issue that I want to talk about is concentration of capital and wealth distribution. Gini coefficient of inequality of household distribution of wealth in India is now in the Latin American range. Latin America is one of the most unequal parts of the world. But the, if you follow, and this, these are from the National Sample Survey, asset and liability survey data, unfortunately, um, not quite up to date, not, not uh, just a few years back, you get, get this data. Uh, but the Gini coefficient, I have com computed and seen that it's near in the Latin American range. The World Inequality Report, uh, which is available, suggests that the top 1% holds about 30% of national wealth, while the bottom half of the population holds about 66%. Both of these data sources, I think, are household surveys, and it's uh, well known that household surveys understate wealth inequality because a lot of underreporting by the rich households. Uh, so oh, the, these two pieces of data that I've just given you are most likely underestimates. The inequality is underestimated. Recently, the Marcellus Investment Consultancy has estimated, and this is about corporate um, inequality, estimated that the 20 most profitable firms generated 14% of total corporate profits in 1990, beginning of the liberalization era that uh, Ajay referred to. In 2010, they had uh, contributed, uh, they generated 30% of total corporate profits. In 2019, 70% of total corporate, big jump. Um, let me comment on this a little bit. Most evidence suggests that these profits were not due to innovation or large productivity rise, but mainly due to market power. These are more in the form of rent rather than profits. The corporate concentration and inequality may be one reason for the rather dramatic disjuncture we have today between the battered real economy in India, just by the pandemic, but even before, going on for a couple of years, between the battered real economy in India and the booming stock market. And this inequality and co corporate concentration, that should be one of the reasons uh, uh, behind that. But you might also say uh, that I'm referring to is 20 most profitable firms in 1990, 2010, and 2019. But 20 most profitable firms are not the same ones. What is 1990 and 2019? So the composition may have changed, yes. And I'm going to talk about that. Particularly the change has been between 1990 and 2010, but not so much between 2010 and 2019. And I'm going to comment on this. In the initial two decades, 1990 to 2010, initial two decades after liberalization, there has been quite a bit of churning. Farms on the top have uh, churned. And this is also the period when there's a rise of regional capital in different parts of India, particularly in South and West of India. There's also quite a bit of competition among these new business groups. Politically, this coincided with the rise of powerful regional political parties and their assertive role 
in the national political coalitions in, the, in that period between 1990 and 2010. Now, with single party dominance and centralization of political power under a supreme leader since 2014, the political economy constellation has changed. Recently, the journalist Harish Damodaran has described this change from entrepreneurial capitalism of the first two decades after liberalization to conglomerate capitalism now. I think Damodaran's article came out in the October issue of the seminar magazine in Delhi. Many of the new entrepreneurs of the earlier two decades became laden and enfeebled by the increasing capital intensity of projects and the demanding requirements of the new technology. Monetization and goods and service taxes push the small and medium businesses to the ropes. In most sectors, I mentioned the sectors like telecom, airlines, steel, cement, aluminium, paints, synthetic fibers, cars, trucks, tires, consumer elections, etc. There are now only two or at most three, most cases not three even, um, players, more than 50% of market share. I regard the current regime is one of crony oligarchy. Favors and special regulatory dispension, dispensations are available only for a select small number of large crony businesses. In some cases, the rules and goalposts were changed midstream to help the cronies. There are many examples, I'll just give you four. Some of you know the story of airport acquisition by the Adanis. Last year, Adanis, who had no experience of running airports, suddenly were given six airports. And this, these were mainly uh, like, I think, Ahmedabad, Lucknow, Jaipur, etc. Six airports. Now, there was a provision in the Civil Aviation Ministry rules that um, the uh, companies which are not, do not have an experience of running an airport are not eligible. Just before giving them to Adanis, those rules were changed and six airports were given. But that business house was interested in a bigger prize. After having acquired the air, six air, smaller airports, they were really interested in the big prize of Mumbai International. And, and, uh, and obstacle there was GVK, who used to own the Mumbai International, GVK, the, the other company. Uh, GVK at that time was debt strapped, uh, were having problems, but still were resisting the acquisition by Adanis. I don't know how many of you know, since I read uh, Indian news, six Indian newspapers every day, and I know in the newspapers, um, one week I suddenly saw that the Ministry of Finance quietly uh, leaked out that they're going to start some special old um, uh, Enquiries that were there already, they're going to revive uh, and inquire into some conditions, uh, financial conditions of GVK. Next day, Business Standard wrote an editorial in which said the ministry seems to be giving unsubtle hints. Within two days, yielded and was open for Adani House acquired Mumbai International uh, and, and those hints uh, by the Ministry of Finance that old cases are going to be revived apparently worked. So these are cases in which rules and goalposts were changed midstream. Second, Adani's coal-based power plant in Jharkhand has been suddenly declared a special economic zone. Just the power plant, coal-based power plant was suddenly declared a special economic zone in 2019 just to give them tax benefits. More than that, 
suddenly in just a few years back, Reliance Geo burst into the telecom sector. The spectacular entry. Complaints made soon by Geo's Reliance's competitors about predatory pricing practices in the telecom sector in violation of earlier regulations of TRI, which is the regulatory authority. TRI then hastily amended the previous rules and changed the definition of significant reliance and limit as 30% of market share. Reliance Geo now holds about 34%. If you read the writings of a very uh, prolific uh, uh, and, and, and investigative journalist, Nitin Shetty, he can give you, I've, I've read some of his stuff, he can give you many examples how pre-existing environmental regulations have been bent for the benefit of Adani's coal mines, etc. Et Six years, Mukesh Ambani, who was the in, in the beginning of the, uh, uh, in 2014, beginning of the current political regime, M Mukesh Ambani was the 40th richest man in the world. Today, he's the fourth richest man in the world. His net worth increased four times in six years. In those six years, Gautam Adani's net worth increased about three times. Favored business houses, even when they are heavily debt strapped, have very little difficulty in raising domestic or foreign money as they enjoy a kind of implicit sovereign guarantee, both in finance and in navigating the murky waters of regulated approvals of the government of India. Meanwhile, the top 50 quote unquote, willful defaulters have robbed the public sector banks of about 1 trillion rupees, largely with impunity. The government has also undermined its own insolvency and bankruptcy code to preserve its discretion in regulatory forbearance for promoters. As some of you know, Urjit Patel has written a book on this issue. And as Ajay referred to, a trial balloon has been floated. This just two, three weeks back. RBI working group about allowing corporate houses to own and control banks. There's been a lot of comments in the media, so I'll, I'll be very brief. This can make the way for connected lending and tunneling depositor money. Um, with India's ineffective and supine regulatory bodies, promises about preventing connected to crony oligarchs will not be very credible. By the way, already the family of the Hindujas have a significant stake in this bank, in the end bank. And also, some of you may know, the government allowed the State Bank of India to have a joint venture with Ambani's Geo Payments Bank. And the former State Bank of India chairperson who closed the deal soon after her retirement the following year, joined the board of Reliance Industries as a non-executive director. Other side in this quid pro process, Corporate money, the other side is corporate money flowing to fill the ruling party coffers. The ingenious con game called electoral bonds introduced in 2017 in the name of electoral reform allowed the copious flow of corporate funds without any disclosure requirement from a small number of business houses, mainly to the ruling party, as has been 
mentioned by several people, including the Association of Democratic Reforms. Are tax deductible. So, in a way, taxpayers are also contributing to the ruling party. The party need, as the regional parties earlier did, raising money from an odd assortment of smaller fish, the liquor barons or the sugar barons, tycoons or PWD contractors, and so on. Now, big national capital funnels ample money to the big national party and is suitably rewarded in a crony capitalist oligarchic system. Maybe for short-term profits to some select group of capitalists, but not for a healthy development of capitalism in India. Nor is the rise in inequality that exacerbates demand deficiency brazen dilution of environmental regulations that poisons and uproots community life and hurts long-term development. Uh, finishing now. Today, most thoughtful people who care about India know that democracy is dying in India. And you don't have to take it. Look at the report of VDEM, the most important institute, Swedish institute, which monitors democracy in large number of countries. If you look at the 2020 report, India had a large decline in the democracy index, and they warned in the recent report that India is now on the verge of losing its status as a democracy. Now, you might say, my talk is about capitalism. What is democracy got to do it. It is true, if you look at the hundred, last hundred years, uh, democracy has died in many countries and capitalists have been mostly uh, complicit with that. But thought, the process through which this decline in democracy has come about has involved a systematic hollowing out various civic and political institutions and a tearing apart of the social fabric. Major lessons of institutional economics is that economic growth and development crucially depend on institutional quality and social harmony. So this should be a matter of concern, even if you care less about democracy and more about capital. Thank you. Let me end here. Thank you so much, Pranab, for those amazing uh, comments uh, on the current state in India in capitalism and democracy. I'll ask you to mute your your uh, microphone. Uh, now would be a great time to submit questions to the Q&A function in WebEx, and I'm going to turn it over to Professor Michael Walton. Michael. Great. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to um... Uh, read and interact and comment on Pranay Baden. And uh, my uh, my first problem is that um, I agree very substan substantially with his uh, uh, his story, his interpretation of um, the situation of capitalism in India. So let me make a, a few complementary um, comments. Uh, One say a uh, couple of words about the nature of oligarchic capitalism and how it has been changing in India. Uh, I want to a couple of words about the labor market reform and the question of uh, where might the response come and what the outlook is. So I'd like to underline something that um, Pranab said that fundamentally this isn't just an issue of capitalism, it's fundamentally a question of the relationship between capitalism and the state, capitalism and, and politicians. That fundamentally, really for a long term, India has had different forms of rent sharing relationships, which has actually cemented the political economy and provided incentives on both sides. Now, uh, this and in the what we loosely call the post liberalization period reached a kind of intensity, 
which where there was a transactional rent sharing uh, uh, in, in the states, across ministries, all over the place, which did create a kind of complex mix of some entrepreneurialism and value creation and stacks of um, monopoly rents. And I think that's, the, that's, a, that's a central idea. There were rising pressures for the channeling of capitalist energy actually not to go more into the rent thick and uh, as opposed to the very genuine areas in IT, pharma, or to, which was productivity creating. One comment I make about um, this period is there was also important countervailing moves, some of it led by civil society, some by the UPA government, and some by real pop popular movements very much to try to constrain this um, intensity of sometimes corruption, sometimes intense wealth creation. And some of that countervailing move, you're most vividly the anti-corruption movement, and this very interesting alliance, implicit alliance between the anti-corruption movement on the street and, and formal accountability bodies of the state especially the CAG, which was revealing the scale of scams under UPA. I want to highlight that. I'm going to come back to it in, 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 in a few minutes. That that actually created the possibility of an interesting reaction to what was a Gilded Age period under the UPA already. As we all know, that was one of the many reasons that the BJP and Prime Minister Modi came into power on a better governance, anti-corruption platform, amongst many other things. I think the interesting question that um, Pranam was very much getting into is that the form of oligarchic capitalism has been changing. And I think two things I'd like to highlight about that. One that Pranam very vividly put, an increased concentration amongst a relatively small uh, number of um, major corporates, a concentration that we see in actually market numbers in terms of Share of, um, share of markets, and a concentration we see in some of the uh, decisions that the state is making, either in regulation or in actual allocation. That's one. The other seeming paradox in this pro-business government is the major loss of trust by the broad, uh, the broader corporate community, which is we is even represented in some of the newspapers um, and is vividly brought on a range of interviews that. Um, I was uh, in the same in the same seminar uh, publication that um, Pranab um, uh, Pranab put forward. So this is this is a, a an interesting apparent paradox, and I think the paradox is related to another theme of Pranab's that in the shall we call it the reaction, and we see under the this government increasing centralization, undercutting old mechanisms of interaction between the state and business, such that the business couldn't have those functional interactions that both created, created deals and created rents and created investment. That made it much harder for much of business to engage with it or good or ill. And the actual increase, the paradoxical increase in uncertainty since um, the more the whether it's unleashing tax audits or uncertain regulation actually makes the current situation more uncertain for most business, apart from those who have very secure ties with the, um, with, with the, um, with the center. Overlaid on that, of course, is the heritage of the kind of Gilded Age, the first Gilded Age expansion, which is the MPA. A lot of the, the non-performing assets, a lot of them created by this uh, excess, a combination of excessive exuberance and um, uh, connected lending. And as Pranab highlighted too, the management of the resolution of the, those non-performing assets, which India has to do, has also added to uncertainty, as not often been discretionary. A couple of words on the labor market. And here, I, um, I very much agree with um, uh, Pranab that there's little or no evidence. You know, the labor market, the, it was a total mess needed cleaning up. Um, uh, no question on that. Little or no evidence that, contrary to what many economists said, that that was the constraint to either overall investment or labor-intensive industrialization. But um, in addition to 
the specific design of the labor market reforms, which um, uh, have reduced the power of labor and re protections without, comp without either specific compensations or more importantly, putting it into a broader context of, a, of, of social protection, where actually I do believe uh, in general in India and in the 21st century, the, the, the need for social protections have to make them much more comprehensive so they're not tightly linked to the labor contract, but need to be broadened um, in ways. And, and that project is sometimes referred to, but is not there. So there's a set of issues around that. And I also agree with Pranav that I'm a big believer in the power, the importance of unions in a democratic society. And right now, there's a bad equilibrium such that um, uh, unions aren't, uh, unions are being weakened further when what's needed is a different union movement. But the thing I'd like to pick up on that Pranup said was the way in which this was implemented in a way that had very little consultation was actually in an area which is fundamentally about consultation. Uh, and that is indicative of this top down uh, majoritarian process which is symptomatic of a broader issue that in the transition to a system uh, where capitalism is supported in a way that is constrained and supports productivity, fundamental to that is independent institutions, a vigorous civil society, and a vigorous independent press. All those are in decline, and all those uh, will uh, 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 undercutting what I think India needs in terms of productive capitalism. Um, I'd like to finish. I was actually teaching the political economy of India um, two weeks ago to my students. Whole mixture, many Indians, many Latin Americans. And I ended that with um, a poll asking, what do you think, this is 80, uh, 50 students, what is the most likely and feasible scenario for growth and state business relations in India? Was it institutional deepening via progressive era reforms, by which I mean the response to the Gilded Age in the US, which was an alliance between populist movements, good populist movements, independent institutions, the Supreme the Courts, the others, the executive, and an independent muckraking press, which actually introduced a whole range of social democratic reforms all the way through the decades of the, um, uh, at least through the, the New Deal. Was that one? Was it a Latin American path of slower growth, rent thick investment, and a long, slow debt workout? Or was it an East Asian path, which I characterized as renewed, high level, proniest investment with growth, which actually is the feature of Thailand, or actually many times. I was struck, 60% of my students said, India looks like it's on a Latin American path of concentrated oligarchic capitalism uh, and slow growth. 20% thought there was hope for the, what is a fundamentally political transition, a genuine progressive response. And 20% thought that, well, maybe the East Asian fast growth, perhaps the Adanas and Obamas and, and Ambadis will actually generate fast concentrated growth, which we may disapprove of, but which um, would actually support long term growth. I leave with that. Thank you so much, Michael. Excellent. Uh, now moving on to Jean Drez. Uh, go ahead, Jean. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pranab, for a very enlightening talk. Uh, as expected, it was very erudite and uh, very convincing. Uh, I, review, I reviewed one of Pranab's book uh, some time ago, and the title was so today again we have heard the voice of reason and like Michael I agree with most of what Pranav has said. I will just say that I feel there is a minor tension between Pranav's appeal for more cooperation and trust between labor and capital which was one of the main points in the first part of his presentation and on the other hand this long catalogue of the predatory practices and abuses of power and conflicts of interest uh, that are endemic in the corporate sector, 
I think that if we really want to foster more cooperative relations between labor and capital, then we do need to level the playing field a little bit and uh, deal with this concentration of power and abuse of power in the corporate sector. And let me tell you in particular that I don't think we are anywhere near a more enlightened attitude of the corporate sector in India towards any kind of social policy or support of the health of workers or labor rights or any such thing. I think they are very clear that they want to exploit the workers to the maximum. And in our own efforts in the last 20 years to uh, campaign for various uh, social policies, uh, whether it's the Employment Guarantee Act, the you know, Food Security Act, uh, so old age pensions and so on. At every step, we had to fight the corporate sector bitterly. And since you read six newspapers a day, I the relentless propaganda in the corporate sponsored media, which is pretty much the entire print and uh, electronic media now nowadays against uh, active social policies. And the reason is very simple, that the corporate sector feels that if there is more expenditure on social programs, then there will be less money for government that they would prefer, like investment in, in, in infrastructure or corporate subsidies, or they will have to be higher taxes. So there's a systematic opposition to any kind of social spending. I do want to say a quick word about capitalism because you have preempted discussion of whether we should save capitalism at all by saying that this was not the topic, which is fair enough. So let's not go into it, but maybe you should have had a different title. Um, you know, I think that in economics, we tend to uh, exaggerate the virtues of the profit motive. Uh, it is true that if you want two different, 200 different kinds of uh, smartphones or ever smarter cars, other material comforts, then the profit system may serve you well. But the for the quality of life, whether it is health or nutrition or education or social security or the environment or public transport or culture or the media or equity or democracy or peace, None of these things are particularly well served by the profit motive. All of them depend much more on various forms of cooperation and public action and non-market institutions than on the profit system. And in fact, as you have yourself illustrated, in many cases, the pursuit of profit undermines these social goals. And therefore, while an element of capitalism is likely to remain for some time in India's economy and society, I would like to think that over time, we can restrain the capitalist element and replace it gradually with other modes of economic and social interaction based on cooperation and democracy. And in the meantime, what we should do also for the purpose of level that, leveling that playing field that uh, you talked about is to restrain the power of the corporate sector. And that brings me to some specific suggestions in that respect, uh, I think the corporate sector and the super rich in India are pampered to no end. In low marginal tax rates, uh, marginal income tax rates at the top, plenty of tax ex exemptions and all kinds of regressive subsidies. And the corporate sector, as you have illustrated, is also allowed frequently to loot public resources, uh, whether it is the environmental or mineral resources or the public sector banks. So that power has to be, and the concentration of power has to be restrained. One thing that can be done for that is more sensible and progressive taxation policies. I think another one that we need to think about a lot more is to enforce much higher transparency norms on the corporate sector and on the super rich because the corporate sector in India is a bit of a black hole and uh, we really need to understand a lot more how power in the corporate sector operates and in particular invades public policy. Uh, I'll give some examples of transparency that we could try to promote. Uh, first of all, the transparency of wealth. 
I don't see why everyone's wealth above a certain threshold, not a very high threshold, and incidentally, that would help to reduce corruption because the crooks would be in a dilemma. If they disclose their wealth, then they would attract uh, attention. And if they hide their wealth, then they risk being charged for failing to disclose their wealth. So that would help to uh, fight corruption aside from bringing greater transparency in the distribution of resources. Secondly, the transparency of debts. Uh, you have mentioned quite rightly the problem of the growing problem of non-performing assets and the stress in the banking sector. Uh, it is indeed really infuriating to see how a poor tribal person in this part of the country, I'm sitting now in Chhattisgarh, uh, the moment they are unable to pay small fines to the forest department, their property is seized or if they don't have any, which is quite often the case, then they are sent to jail for a few days. So on the one hand, we have these innocent, power, powerless people being sent to jail at the drop of a hat for minuscule debts. And at the same time, uh, super rich people are able to uh, default on huge sums of money, literally in thousands. We seem to have temporarily lost Jean. So if we can get him back, we'll proceed. Otherwise, I'll jump into question. So I'll wait for about two seconds. Jean, are you there? No? Then forgive me, I will proceed with question and answers. Um, Q&A, the reason why is that it seems that our speakers and the panelists are in particular agreement. Let's go on to the questions then. So I'll start with, um, my colleague, Manny Teitelbaum, given the loopholes and vagueness in the new labor code, what is the scope for the judiciary to clarify the law or for states to amend the law in ways that might be more favorable to workers? Need to cover. Uh, um, here he's back. Sorry. 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 Yes, you're back. Excellent. You just faded out for a short bit. Okay. So electoral bonds, I think you have covered quite adequately. Then, uh, transparency of lobbying and consulting activities because public policy is increasingly influenced by corporate lobbying and quite explicitly so. If I have another minute, let me quickly read to you what one of the good or <laughs> allegedly good corporates in India, Nandan Nilekani, uh, says about corporate, corporate lobbying. He says a true entrepreneur will figure out all the government processes and follow them to the letter. He will people masters happy, get his project mentioned in every important speech and every government document of relevance, get his bills tabled in the parliament and enacted as law, secure his budget, cooperate with investigating agencies, respond to court orders, answer parliamentary questions, and tireless, tirelessly provide information sought in RTI requests. So that's the kind of activism now that we are seeing in the corporate sector to influence public policy. Of course, nothing new, but perhaps more than activities. And also I would say of consultancy activities because consultancy is another way in which the corporate sector influences public policy. And finally, I would say transparency of internal democracy in the enterprise, including, for example, the spread of salaries within the enterprise, which already has to be reported to some extent under the Companies Act, and uh, also things like worker representation on corporate boards. And I would even say that corporate taxes could be uh, lower for enterprises that have more internal democracy, and that would help us to move away from capitalism towards a more democratic economic system. So these are just illustrations of ways in which the corporate sector can be made more accountable and corporate power uh, can be restrained so that we can move towards a more cooperative and trusting relation 
between capital and labor. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. That was wonderful. Uh, really appreciate it. Since we have so much agreement between panel and speaker, let's move on to Q&A. The first one is from Manny Teitelbaum, who asks about the vagueness in the new labor law, and is there a way that the judiciary could clarify things in a way that would help workers? Uh, also, we have Deepak Sharma asking, has state capitalism failed in India, unlike China? Neither do they employ a large number of people, nor do they serve the social or public purpose in proportion to the share of the economy. And then from Azim Khan, how would you analyze the farmers' protests with respect to the discussion today? And then Arayan Goyal, Pranab, uh, sir, had mentioned the labor reforms and other reforms. I wanted to ask the panelists about their thoughts on the new farm laws. Um, that's where we'll stop now. Anyone wants to chime in, beginning with the speaker, please do. We will have to go over today by five to 10 minutes to address the remaining questions. My apologies to those in the audience with uh, schedule otherwise. Proceed. Shall I begin? Let me first, uh, res um, you know, it's gratifying, uh, not unexpected, it's gratifying to find my two discussions um, uh, agreeing with me or I agree with almost everything they said. But, uh, so let me just to uh, illustrate uh, some things that they said, uh, I want to supplement uh, a bit. Uh, on, uh, let me uh, begin with the second discussion, which is Jean. Um, uh, one of the reasons I should say that um, uh, I didn't discuss the issue of uh, capitalism as such, uh, is that I think, in general, whenever you say things in critique of capitalism as such, then um, people say, oh, then immediately they switch off. A lot of people switch off and say, oh, these are another bunch of lefties uh, saying all these things. But I didn't, I somehow probably wrongly uh, didn't want them to switch off. I just wanted to say even for their own cause, they are being myopic. So that was the reason, uh, I, I, even from the point of view of profitability and productivity, in the long run, they're doing the wrong thing. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to mention is, is something that I want to emphasize with Jean did, is the issue of transparency. Uh, in fact, it's related to the issue of taxation. That's taxation, but one aspect of transparency I want to talk about is the issue of taxation. Jean rightly pointed out, and I have written on this, I think that India not merely has one of the lowest tax GDP ratios of all major economies, um, but some of those, uh, some of those uh, direct taxation fields, like wealth taxation, which you mentioned, uh, wealth taxation was recently abolished. What is the ground? The ground is it does not yield much revenue. First of all, the wealth taxation in India that did not yield much revenue, therefore abolished. Um, they don't yield much revenue because the loopholes are so large and a lot of wealth is exempted. And therefore you don't get, a, you don't expect to raise much tax. But more importantly, the purpose of wealth tax is not just to raise uh, revenue. And this is something I think Thomas Piketty, who's uh, in his book, the first book, um, emphasized. He was supporting wealth tax not just for revenue. He says a country which has wealth tax at least tries to collect data on wealth. So over time, you have a setup uh, of transparency or at least attempted transparency at wealth, uh, at uh, information about wealth. Otherwise, you don't have anything. And similarly, it's not one aspect of wealth taxation, which is also quite scandalous in India. India abolished inheritance tax in the 1980s. And with all the rise in extreme inequality, wealth inequality in India, you don't pay any tax when you inherit vast amounts of wealth. Uh, so, and there also then the data issue comes in. You have more data about who's inheriting, how much 
maybe not perfect data, so but from, even from the transparency, not just the revenue angle, I think the wealth taxation inheritance tax is important. One issue uh, with uh, that I wanted to raise, and I think more about it, uh, Michael's uh, point, and the, he made one of the, one point he made at the very end about uh, uh, East Asian case of there also kind of crony conglomerate capitalism. So maybe uh, India, I think what 20% of your students say that maybe that India may take that path. I'm I'm less uh, I'm more doubtful on that on that uh, that even the crony uh, the conglomerate capitalism of East Asia is feasible in India, and this is primarily because of the background, the historical background of East Asia. So let me take the case of, uh, by the way, not all of East Asia. For example, Taiwan is not conglomerate capitalism. Korea is, South Korea is. In South Korea and Taiwan, if you look at conglomerate capitalism of, of Korea, the state is much more effective in Korea. Secondly, because of the post-war land reform in Korea, inequality was, the pre-existing inequality was much less than in India. And thirdly, education. Korea, even when it started, uh, say in the late 60s, um, the educational level was much higher than what we in India. So I think the preconditions are such that I don't expect the East Asian conglomerate capitalism model uh, is going to India, going to work in India. I'll give other reasons, but let me not spend more time uh, on this. Uh, but I very much appreciated uh, Michael's comments. So the three, three questions in the Q&A, there are three issues that have been raised. One is about the judiciary. I already mentioned that in the labor laws, um, the civil courts have been barred from uh, taking any disputes on the occupational health and safety issues. Uh, and already in the industrial relations code, the, uh, the tribunals, the government reserves the right to completely ignore the tribunal verdicts. So in a sense, it's, it's in a, there have been attempt to already try to take it from away from the judiciary. But if you think of the higher judiciary, I think a lot of people in India will say the higher, the way the higher judiciary is behaving is um, leave much to be desired. And um, in fact, like the large part of the electronic media, uh, large part of the civil society, uh, the higher judiciary is also uh, quite silent on many of the obvious violations of, I would say, um, the judiciary has been allowing the government to what I would regard is trashing of the uh, uh, Indian constitution. And so if, if they are being uh, doing this with impunity, I doubt if they will have problems in enforcing the current labor laws. On the issue of has state capitalism failed? Uh, state capitalism never really succeeded, uh, and not just today. Um, state capitalism, state capitalism, uh, uh, the um, I don't think it was ever in India. Uh, it was the the nearest state capital, successful state capitalism in recent years was in China. But that, all, that too is not also state capitalism. It's more like state guided and large controlled capitalism. But India does not have anything of that kind. And so I, I, I think it's before saying state capitalism has failed, I think state capitalism didn't even start in India. But that's my view, but I can go into more details if necessary. On the farm laws, I have views, but <laughs> This is probably not the right occasion. I know it's the it's the big uh, hot topic in India. Uh, on farm laws, I'm somewhat ambiguous. Uh, if you want to know my position, uh, not in the context of my talk today, on farm laws, my position is somewhat ambiguous. I, I in general, 
I want reform in the agricultural marketing, but the way they are going, first of all, the process, you know, you don't discuss with anybody. So as it, since you don't discuss, you are essentially uh, muting, to use the current word, muting, muting the parliament. So therefore you have to uh, get opposition in the streets. Unfortunately, we are not having enough opposition in the streets, but at least the Punjab farmers are sufficiently vocal and with their tractors, they can come to Delhi. Delhi is near enough. Um, but um, the, so the process is simply highly some deplorable that you are, you have to bypass the usual channels of democracy. Um, but that's about the process, about the content. I'm in favor of reform in the agricultural marketing, but you cannot throw things uh, at the, make things freer for the market, while at the farmer's side is this numerous people, small people, they have no bargaining power with the vis-a-vis -vis the corporates. So make things easier for the corporates, easier for the uh, market. Um, I'm in, in general in favor of market reform, but when there is, a, you know, the other side, there is some, uh, I, they use the expression that has been already used, the countervailing power has to be there. There's no countervailing power. If you can organize the farmers in the form of farming companies or cooperatives, etc., there will be then a possibility of some uh, level paying playing field. Uh, but I have some problems with MSP. I think Punjab itself is being hurt by MSP because that's why only these two crops uh, are being grown. Punjab needs more diversification of agriculture, which is being prevented by the MSP system. I'm in favor of reforming the MSP. And finally, let me say um, my pet theme that I'm in favor of helping people through income rather than price support. I, I'm more in favor of uh, help income support than price support. Let me end there. Great, I will uh, let it run through one more round of commentary if you don't mind, questions. Uh, first off, uh, Vikram Nehru was interested in knowing if there's going to be a scarring effect of COVID on India political economy. Uh, Aditya Dar, one of our graduates from GW, who's in India now, uh, says, uh, was wondering whether you would like to distinguish between good or bad capitalists. And does capitalism in non-rent thick sectors in India also need to be saved from its capitalists? Um, I'll stop there and uh, just have, uh, yes, I'll stop there since we're short of time and let uh, the professor respond. <laughs> One of the reasons I avoided COVID is I think Ajay told me that you had the other sessions were all on COVID. Yes. So th that's the reason. Um, but I not political it, economy. <laughs> not political economy, right. Um, COVID, all over the world, COVID is increasing inequality of various kinds. And, uh, and, and certainly India, uh, the COVID uh, it will increase uh, inequality in the same way and probably even more because it's the informal sector, it's the women uh, who will suffer much more from uh, as a result of the COVID and, and the scurrying certainly will be there uh, for a long time. But also I think uh, India not merely had probably one of the world's harshest lockdowns, India also had one of the most mismanaged uh, COVID situation. Uh, uh, the, and uh, this, uh, this, I think this requires a lot of discussion, but I, I think it was the, much of the hardship, much of the scarring of the COVID was preventable. Um, if the government, just think about March 24, the government announced this harsh, one of the harshest lockdowns in the world with four hours notice. On March 24, another important country, South Africa, announced lockdown. But they gave South Africa four days to adjust. And here, four hours. So this because we are, we are, our government is prone to theatrics 
rather than what happens to poor people. I think the management of COVID has shown not merely incompetence of the government, it has shown callousness of the government. Versus bad capital. In a way, that's what partly what I was talking about, namely those who are into innovation, those those capitals who are into innovation, the right kind, that kind of innovations, or short or myopic innovations, but good kind of innovations, productivity raising, etc. They are in being hurt by this this crony oligarchy that I was describing. So yes, um, the but unfortunately the uh, the we are going in the wrong direction. For good kind of capitalism, uh, there are all kinds of um, all kinds of um, measures that one might take, but. Good capitalists, and that's the reason, for example, I gave you the example of the Global Innovation Index. In the mm -hmm. Global Innovation Index, United States is number nine. And if you look at the top eight, includes mostly social, many social democratic countries, as I mentioned, which are labor here. Those are capitalist countries, Sweden, uh, Germany. These are capitalist countries, but they are much more labor friendly. So they are there in that in that sense a long they are much longer horizon and that's what I think capitalism if even if you support capitalism you need to support that kind of capitalism not the one that India is having going toward right now let me stop there thank you then I would like to uh, apologize to those of you who have additional questions we didn't get to but I wanted to finish the today's discussion with a co final commentary. Uh, by our two discussants, if they have a final word, starting with Jean Drez, you're on. Okay. Sorry. Well, <laughs> I'll quickly say something about this. Actually, I suspect that a lot of capitalists in India are bad in the sense that their wealth is built on cheating and exploitation. I don't uh, this at all, so I don't really know about them. But if you look at the average capitalist in a small town, it's pretty clear that a lot of them are actually making money by cheating and exploitation and looting of public resources. Capitalist is bad. I would say there are many who are not bad in the sense that they are doing honest business. And business is not a sin. Uh, if you do business honestly, you observe the law, you uh, you respect the environment and your workers. I would say you are my view would be someone who democratizes his firm and stops maximizing profit. Would stop being a capitalist. Michael. Yep. Uh, just to add, because the, the movement in the United States and elsewhere is uh, the question of how a, what is now often called stakeholder capitalism, can actually be more supported and more productive. And the question is, under what conditions will that, will the debate go in that direction in, um, in, in India? I'd also say, yes, that good capitalists in the sense of pursuing productive innovation will also very strongly respond to the context and that is where um, that is where uh, effective labor reforms are required that support the types of union engagement that can also be productivity um, increasing that's all for now There, I've done it. Uh, fantastic. I want to uh, thank uh, Professor Pranab Bardhan, Michael Walton, and Jean Drez for their thoughtful insights today, and uh, our audience for their questions and attention. And now from the George Washington University in our Envisioning India series, good day and good evening. <laughs>